All right, what up, everybody? It is your boy, BQ. This is the Impact Lounge, the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. And uh, this evening, going to be talking Under Siege, giving you my thoughts on the show, which was a great show. If you have not seen Under Siege, uh, this this is definitely the one to check out. If, you have, if you've been sleeping on the Impact Plus shows, haven't seen an Impact Plus show in a while, um, this is the one. This was This was a really, really good show. And uh, they they typically are good. They typically are good. The uh, the monthly specials that they do. You know the biggest complaint that I've had in relation to the television episodes is that I don't think they're a good representation of how good these shows typically are. Because the TV is very hit or miss, and we've had a couple real duds this year. As far as television goes, and we've had some good shows too. And, you know, I would say these monthly specials, these pay per views, these Impact Plus, whatever you want to call it, uh, I I would say they have like a good 80% success rate of being excellent. You know, every once in a while, it's like, eh, you know, like I don't know about against all odds. That's the next one. It's coming in two weeks. They've got two weeks to build it. So they have no choice but to give us two weeks of good, solid television, you know? And uh, it might be one of those shows that have a bunch of matches for the sake of matches. You know, we don't know. But um, I would imagine the next two weeks of television are going to be pretty good because they have no choice to build up that show. But we're not talking about that. We're talking Under Siege. So before I get in Under Siege, I've been talking about this the last few weeks. This is my last review for the next several months because I'm beginning my move to Nevada, which includes moving out of this house. I, uh, my setup in here, everything and, and all that is going to be uh, no more as of tomorrow. So all of June, all of July, all of August, um, I'll be out of pocket. I'll be offline. Most likely here on the YouTube channel, I'm going to do some YouTube shorts and do a little bit of content checking in for my cell phone, you know, just, just to kind of, uh, talk with you guys a little bit, um, gives, give some thoughts, but as far as impact plus reviews, the, uh, reviews of the episode, uh, you know, unfortunately you're, you're getting nothing for the next three months. So I do apologize for that. That is a long time to, to say that, Hey, I'm not going to be giving you content. I know that it's going to hurt my channel. Uh, the last time I took an extended break really, really hurt my channel, but I had to do it for, I hate using this term, but for my own mental health, I had to take a, a really long break. I think it was like half a year. So this is going to be about a three month break. I'm hoping it's not going to be any longer than that, but um, that's just, that's just my process of of packing up, moving out of state, buying a house getting moved in and all that. So again, I apologize. I will try to be a little more active on Twitter than I typically am. And, you know, again, I will try to do some kind of cell phone content, you know, for the channel. So it's not completely dead because that's even in my own, my own interest because YouTube, YouTube will penalize me for having a dead channel and not put my notifications out. So, you know, I gotta, I gotta try to do something. So, uh, the time has come for my break. Patreon has been paused, uh, pause billing, uh, so just just no content from me. So let's talk. Let's talk under siege. Excellent show. It really was like top to bottom, one of their better shows because even when they do these Impact Plus specials, there's still one or two duds on there. There there typically is. Uh, and I'll say that I was I was fairly entertained, or very much entertained for this entire thing. So was there some things that were better than others? Yeah, absolutely, of course. You know, but when you're talking about three, this was like three and twenty, three minutes, twenty hours, including three minutes, twenty hours, three hours, twenty minutes of wrestling. If you're including the pre-show, I'm gonna say this like I always do. I think these are too long. I think there's so much wrestling content out there right now 
that I think these are best served to be about an hour shorter than they are. So two hours show, 30 minutes of a pre-show, and I think that's it. I think um, I think it should kind of be like a glorified episode of Impact. I think three hours, three and a half hours is entirely too long for this. Uh, but they, they disagree. My personal opinion is that because there's so many wrestlers on per appearance deals, you know, they have to satisfy dates and then they have to justify contracts, you know? So that's my, my personal opinion that, that why they get so many uh, people on the show and get so many matches on, but it it is too long in my opinion. So we're talking uh, the pre-show here, countdown to under siege, if you will. And it was the Knockouts World's Tag Team Champions, the Coven versus the Death Dolls. And this is uh, the iteration of the Death Dolls here is Courtney Rush and Jessica. Um, What I had said when I was reviewing Impact is that when Courtney Rush ran out, the crowd was dead. They did pop for the initial, oh, like Courtney Rush, Courtney Rush, but they were dead. Like she was putting on the sharpshooter. No one gave a shit. And what the other thing I was talking about on that review, the reason for that is because it's a taped program. They're building storylines backstage, and then they play out in the ring, and the fans have no idea what's going on. And I think the storylines work when you you, you either got to build all of it backstage or all of it in the ring. But when you start mixing the two together the live audience gets very confused. And I know because I've been one of those live audience members before, didn't know what the hell they were doing. Uh, They've been doing this forever. And it seemed like they've kind of been working around it. But the last couple of weeks, there were some segments that happened in the ring where the crowd had no clue what the F was going on. And that was one of them. They didn't know why this Rosemary wasn't there. They probably saw Rosemary wrestle as Rosemary to kick off that set of tapings. You know, I tell the story. I haven't in a long time, but I I tell it. I used to tell it all the time that I was in the impact zone in Orlando and I watched Jesse Goddard's uh, team up with Eli Drake. And uh, 15 minutes later, Jesse Goddard's came out as a member of the bromance. And I'm sitting here like, what the fuck is going on here? And, uh, you know, I know the people around me were very confused as well, and they do these kind of things. But uh, this actual match here, thank God it was a non-title match, because I've been saying this forever. Don't defend every single title at the dam at these events, especially the Knockouts Tag Team Championships, because there's not enough teams. Do a damn non-title match. It's not the end of the world. And that's what they did here. It's a non-title match. I knew that the Death Dolls were going to win, because... The Coven's booking is a version of 50-50. They're not wrestling the same people every week, but one week they lose, the next week they win. One week they lose, the next week they win. If you don't believe me, pay attention in this upcoming month, this upcoming tapings. That is what they've done with the Coven like clockwork. They do not string together two wins in a row. I think they did have two losses in a row at one point, but two wins in a row does not happen. Uh, the pins usually are eaten by Kylan King. Taylor Wilde's a little more protected, but I knew that the doc, the um, the Death Dolls were going to win here. And I will be honest, I'm not super familiar with Courtney Rush's work. I've seen pictures of Courtney Rush, and I'm I'm speaking about the gimmick. Um, I understand she's the same person as Rosemary, but I always felt like from what I saw. And some of the, I did see a couple matches like versus Allie when she was Cherry Bomb. I thought that the gimmick was a little similar to Rosemary. I don't remember it being like this. So she's Courtney Rush, but she's more acting like Jessica. Um, I'm not against it because it's something different. I thought the Death Dolls were very stale. They used to at least have a cool entrance. They stopped having a cool entrance. But I thought they were really stale. I thought Rosemary started getting really stale, which is crazy because she's one of the best characters on the show, or at least has been for a really long time. The match was okay. It's a it's a countdown match. I'm not expecting, uh, you know, Mildred Burke to walk through the door and put on a Matt classic, but it was it was okay. 
and uh, Courtney Rush puts on the sharpshooter, makes Taylor Wilde submit. They're going to keep fighting. So the Coven Death Dolls is the the gift that keeps keeps on giving, and we're just going to get them versus each other forever. And I guess that's what you got to do when you have no tag teams. So Death Dolls, Death Doll wins. Digital Media Championship, Joe Hendry versus Dirty Dango. I talked about Dirty Dango in my review. I am on board 100% with what he's doing. I don't think it's uh, an excuse. And the same for, this is something that I spoke in detail about on the Impact Review. Dango, Courtney Rush, um, Sammy Callahan's mystery partner. We got good payoffs, or maybe they're not payoffs, but they're they're pretty damn close to it. You know, they're close to the end of the stories. We got stuff that people were interested in, but it's not an excuse for bad television, weeks of bad television leading up to it. Like, I'm intrigued with the Courtney Rush stuff, but like six weeks of horrible Coven and Death Doll segments, like that doesn't justify what I just watched. You know, same with the Dango stuff. I, I didn't hate that as much. I actually liked some of it. I like the majority of it, actually, but um, there was still it was the reveal of him being the attacker, which was horrible. I'm not going to repeat myself why I was horrible, because I did on the last two impact reviews. Uh, terrible. But, but for the most part, you know, the who attack, attack Santino shit kind of made me laugh. Uh, I wish that Dango would change his name, though. I think that's the next step, you know, to give give a serious name, because that is a horrible name. I liked this match quite a bit. It was actually one of my favorite matches on the card. And uh, I know it was one of the matches I pretty publicly stated I wasn't looking forward to at all and didn't care. And I still, you know, like part of me didn't care, but part of me did because I was invested in the new Dango. If it was the old Dango versus Joe Hendry, I wouldn't care even a little bit. But I do like these kind of re- uh, wrestling matches. This is kind of wrestling uh, wrestling fan that I am. I prefer this to Mike Bailey versus Chris Saban because I'm not the X Division style, if you want to call it, is not my favorite style of wrestling. And tag team wrestling is not really my favorite style of wrestling. So when you got a couple guys, you know, six foot dudes, decent builds, know how to work, like I, I, I just prefer to watch wrestling like that. Now, again, Joe Hendry versus Dirty Dango, the one we've seen the last half year or year, however long he's been in the company, no interest in that. This version of Dango, yeah, I have a, I have a little bit of interest. I have a lot of interest, actually. Uh, I want to see what he um, continues to do going forward. So I actually did like this match when it was one I didn't think I was going to care for at all. I thought it was a, you know, a joke match. And now I'm like, huh, I'm interested. I wanted Dango to win the belt. Because he's right. It's a toy belt. It's a prop. It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. So I think putting it on a guy like Dango, who is saying, I don't really need this job, blah, 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 blah. It's the perfect title for him. Perfect. But they have a pretty decent match, but Dango gets himself disqualified on purpose, which plays into... That the title means nothing to him. That this job means nothing to him. It it plays into all that perfect. Now, he was getting ready to hit the leg drop from the top rope. And then here comes Santino. And it was a little bit of comedy Santino. Like, he was was mad, but he was also doing the silly march and and all that. Um, Even though I'm looking forward to whatever Dango does here, in the near future, I'm not really interested in him wrestling Santino or whatever it is they're trying to do with that. So that I'm not like super interested. In. I hope it doesn't last too terribly long. Might wrestle Santino at, at against all odds, but but I am down to see uh, what's up with Santino. And we get uh, into the main show, and it kicks off with Nick Aldis versus Kenny King. And 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 same thing like I just said. These are the kind of matches. I enjoy ro- watching. You know, they're, they're selling. There's guys who look like professional wrestlers. 
I enjoyed this. This was uh, one of my favorite matches. I was glad that it kicked it off. And I love Kenny King. I really, really... Uh, he's really become one of my favorites. But this was a really good match. We knew that Nick Aldis was going to win. He wins by submission. I don't think he's going to continue to feud with Kenny King, but they're going to find something else for him to do because he you know, is not immediately inserting himself into the title picture. It's crazy that Nick Aldis, you know, former NWA champion, recognizes and the company recognizes that he has to earn his way to a title shot. But then in the sixth way, you got Jabamura, who's never beat anybody, and he somehow just gets inserted in there. So you might as well put Nick, Nick Aldis in there, right? But um, I'm glad that they're not. And Nick Aldis and Kenny King had an excellent match. Enjoyed it quite a bit. It didn't you know, go too long. It just all made sense. What was a little hokey was when Nick Aldis was walking back to the entranceway and all of a sudden points to the rafters. And it, I thought he was pointing at the WrestleMania sign. I was like, what is he doing? But it was, it was very hokey. But he points and it's Killer Kelly and Masha Slamovich still going at it. And they're wrestling throughout the arena. And kind of like I said at the top of the show, probably justifying uh, a date, a paper appearance, you know, get them on the show. But I'm still interested to see because I, I've been wanting to see these two wrestle with, with a build, not just wrestle to wrestle. But I've wanted to see a little bit of a build to it. So even though I worry this is leading to like a monster's ball or something, my hope is that it leads to a not, last knockout standing or a falls count anywhere. I can dig those kind of matches. But if it's, you know, Scott Demore comes out, ah, got me no DQ, like, fuck you. We're going to talk about Scott Demore later. Um, I, I really popped folks. That was, that was one of the best moments for me forever. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to get into that, but they're brawling throughout the arena. Masha took a hell of a bump off the, she kind of fell over the guardrails. I was like, Oh shit. Um, Excuse me, my, my nose is starting to run a bit. I hate people that podcast and sniffle a lot on the air. I'm going to try my best not to do that. It's probably a good reason I'm taking a pod and taking a break from the podcasting because I've been under the weather quite a bit lately, and then the allergies kicking in and all that good stuff. So Jordan Grace did a really really good interview with Gia. You know, short and sweet. If I can't be the best, who am I? I I called it that. I'm sorry, I'm not I didn't call it, but I predicted. Deanna would win. And then I changed my mind to Jordan Grace like the day before. And <laughs> that was the wrong choice. All right. Then we got the design. Diener, Khan, and Angels versus Sammy Callahan, Rich Swan, and their partner, Jake Christ. I think we had a pretty good idea that it was going to be Jake. Most people wanted it to be Jake. I think there was a, I think we felt like it was 90% possibility that it was going to be him. I don't know why I was kind of hoping it was Tessa Blanchard. I know a lot of people don't want to see her back, but I felt she was the biggest star in the company when she was around. I would love to see her back personally, but I'm happy with Jay Chris. Once Rich Swan was announced as a partner, I didn't think Madman Fulton made sense as the third person. So uh, Jay Chris is that guy. And people were pretty excited about it uh, within the impact bubble. Of course, there's no buzz created by this. This is all in the impact bubble. But people were excited because Jay Chris was very popular. They didn't like the way he, you know, his contract wasn't renewed because of what happened with his brother. I think he's distanced himself from his brother. After all that, at least it, it appears that he has. So it's good to see him back. And I know that with his wife, I don't believe things ended on the best of terms. So I didn't know what his status was with, with Impact, but he's the guy here. And the way that they announced him, I think, was appropriate. You know, it wasn't the lights didn't go out. They didn't build it up anything crazy. He just came out with them a couple seconds later. I thought Rich Swan looked great. You know, um, I think he I wish he would have went all black instead of any pink, but I thought he looked really good. He fit with what they were doing. He had an OVE hat. So this was um, this was pretty cool. And I know most people don't care about the design. They're not over. 
but you know the match was pretty solid i use i typically enjoy anything rich swan is doing so you know i was kind of into it and of course i like angels and then uh it was good to see jay christ back swan pins angels for the victory here and that was his second win over angels he beat him the week before on the tv show which is crazy because usually when they do something like this, it's like their attempt to throw you on the, off the scent of what's really going to happen. And this was one of the first of two times where someone got a, a, a win on the TV show and had momentum and then went on to win. So Rich Swan gets the roll-up. The roll-up tells me that this is not over. <laughs> this is not over by a long shot. There's going to be more design versus these guys. It is going to continue. It is another gift that keeps on giving. So, yes, awesome, Jay Chris. Hope, hopefully he's back back. Let me take a drink here. Give me a second. Trinity versus Giselle Shaw. I think most people like this more than I did. I thought Trinity's match with Kylan King was really good. I thought that was excellent. But what I said about Trinity when she signed with the company, and I've said this for years about her, from when I was watching WWE, not watching WWE, and people were talking about her, and I was just participating in conversation. People like to say, yo, she is athletic, and she is athletic, but I do find her to be reckless i think her her style is very out of control and it, and it's because of her athleticism but because of that there's a lot of moves that look good and then there's a lot of moves that look very very bad and you know they tried to do a code red at the end of this match and it and it looked bad but it was okay i just i wasn't on this like everybody else was but i love giselle and I, you know, I typically enjoy anything that she's doing. So um, I enjoy, the, I still enjoy the match for that reason. I'm just saying I probably didn't love it like everyone else did. And then she wins a start with the starstruck submission, which I'm really glad she's doing that because, you know, I, I've said it, I said it again when I was watching WWE that the rear view was a very silly finisher. And I don't think there's any room for the rear view and impact wrestling. Like if you want to do it a little bit cool, but I just don't think it should be beating your knockouts. The Trinity wins. We knew Trinity was going to win. She's not going to lose any matches under the impact banner. I'm just going to throw that out there right now. She's probably going to wrestle Deanna at Slammiversary. She could win, uh, but that's the only person that's going to beat her. Just so get it out of your, head that that there's any chance that she's going to lose any of these matches they could put her in a one on three versus three dudes they are not going to beat trinity and impact just get it out get it out of your head via interviews subculture and brian myers and the good hands come out and subculture says they'll defend against them when they win so tag team title match was abc and you guys got to help me on this. I thought Ace and or ABC was the Ace and Bay connection because that's what they said. But on the screen, it says Ace and Bay Club, which makes more sense. So maybe they were like, hey, connection. And then the next week realized, oh, duh, club. I don't know. But I don't care because I think that the name is awful. But it's uh, ABC versus Subculture, which is Mark Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster with Danny Luna in their corner. And I believe she does wrestle on the upcoming set of tapings. And, uh, this was pretty good. It was, just, it was cool to see Mark Andrews back in impact. But like I said, at the top of the show, tag team wrestling is not necessarily my favorite, favorite thing either. I, I enjoy one-on-one -on -one wrestling. I enjoy one person versus one person, one guy versus one guy, one gal versus one gal. The more you add to a match, the less I usually have interest in it. That doesn't mean there aren't tag teams in the world that I like and, and all that. But just in general, I prefer one-on-one -on -one wrestling. Um, it's just the era of tag team wrestling we're in where they're cooperating with each other. And it's it's just not realistic. Everyone's standing in a group. And 
waiting for someone to jump off the top rope and hit him and not my style. But I'm sure that this was match was very, very popular with a lot of people. And, you know, it was a good match. And ABC hits the art of finesse to win. I think we're going to see subculture around for a while. Much like everybody else, they're probably not going to sign. But I think we're going to see them around for a while. I wouldn't be surprised if they have a rematch at some point and take the titles off them. Because Impact is not above that. Of bringing a team in that doesn't sign and winning the belts. You know, they've done it with the girls, they've done it with the guys. So I wouldn't be surprised if that doesn't ultimately happen. But I know they're trying to build something with the good hands. If if I had to take my guess, it's at a slam anniversary. It's gonna be ABC versus the good hands versus subculture. There might even be a fourth team in there. But if I had to take a guess, that's what they're going to do. They typically like to load up these tag team matches at the big pay-per-view. The good hands are not good enough to wrestle two-on-two on a pay-per-view. So that's what I think. I I mean, I guess there could be another team. I don't know who. They might be able to throw um, Kenny King and, and uh, Sheldon and Gene in there. I, I wouldn't be shocked at all, actually. So that's my that's what I think is going to happen, actually, a slam anniversary. I think it's going to be a four-way between those teams but for those who like this style of wrestling th- this was good ace and bay win you know we, we fully expected that to happen uh we got trey miguel versus chris saban and um i thought chris saban was going to win this match well i don't know that i thought he was going to win but i had said when i was doing my preview I said both Motor City Machine Guns are not going to lose. One of them will win their respective match. I was leaning towards Chris Chris Saban winning the X Division Championship, but I was very, very confident that one of them were going to win. Chris Saban was the one that lost, and they put on another good match. Kind of, kind of a fuck finish when when Trey Miguel sprayed him in the eyes. That means that this is going to continue. So so most of these matches were left open ended off here because I think it against all odds <coughs> they're going to wrestle again and there's going to be stipulations but and maybe that's what they had to do because the show's in 2 weeks excuse me guys <coughs> the show's in 2 weeks maybe that's what just what they had to do but they definitely left a lot of these open ended and um you know, good match. Everything Trey does is really good. I love heel Trey Miguel. I'm going to be very disappointed the day that he drops that belt because he is doing the best work of his impact wrestling career. But but we do we're not going to have an impact show without a fuck finish, like the, the, just the way that it is. Number one contenders match was Moose versus Eddie Ed- Edwards versus Jonathan Gresham versus Yuya Jabamura versus Alex Shelley versus. Frankie Kazarian. When I did my impact review yesterday, one thing that I kind of forgot to mention was that on impact, the go home show, they had a little video package and all six of these guys spoke and told us why they needed to win this match. I have been asking for this forever in regards to multi-person matches. I've always said, you know, if you're going to do, you know, I, I said, it, it goes back to when the knockout said the ultimate X. I said, where's the video packages where they all speak and all tell us where they, why they need to win. Then there's been other multi-man matches. I'm like, where are the video packages? And now we got one and they told us why they needed to win. Even Jabba Morris spoke. He didn't speak in English, but even he spoke. This is that little thing you do where it just just doesn't just feel like a match of guys that you threw together. So this was um this this was solid. Again, it's a it's a six way match, so it's not my favorite style of wrestling. I feel like I've said that about majority of these matches here. Oh, it's not my style, it's not my style, but this is the best show they've ever done. <laughs> you gotta understand for me, I also can recognize when something's good. It just maybe not my my style of good, 
but I recognize when it's good. Um, I had initially had Frankie Kazarian winning this thing because of the video, not video packages, but whatever he was doing with Gia, the sit down, which they said was a new impact segment and we're never going to see it again. I assure you. But I thought with Frankie doing all that, there was a chance he was going to win. But then he had the little run in with Eddie Edwards last week. And I said, oh, that's where they're going with it. Those two are going to wrestle. And then it only made sense that Alex Shelley was going to win because he was the one that had the storyline of, you know, someone who's been in the company for the longest amount of time, the best wrestler to never win the world title. And, you know, there's a few people in that category that were, you know, that, that wrestled for TNA for a really long time. And I think we see it with today's programs too, in today's product where they like to put the belts off guys who are in and out. And the guys who they're, they know we're going to stick around the girls who knew they know we're going to stick around. They don't put belts on them, <laughs> you know? So Alex Shelley was, you know, locked down to TNA for a long time. And, you know, they said, okay, well, we got him. So we're not going to put the world title on him. I'm glad that the Motor City Machine Gun split up, though, because I just feel like, I feel like we're at that point. You've seen one match. You've seen them all. And I think it's good for both of them to split up a little bit. And I think there's still a little bit of money in when they wrestle as a tag team. But at this point, with this company, I think they just needed to split up. But I knew Moose wasn't going to win. I knew Jonathan Gresham. I would. I wanted to see Jonathan Gresham win, but uh, I knew he wasn't going to. I knew Jabba Moore wasn't going to win. I mean, get that freaking hell out of here. But Alex Shelley wins. He hits shell shock on Jabba Moore because you know he need. They needed someone to take the pin, and he was the best person to do it. And this was the other instance where someone won on the previous episode, like when they did a three on three match. He was the guy that got the win, had the momentum, and then he came and won the match. Usually when someone wins on the episode prior and it looks like they have momentum, that's what they do to throw you off the scent of who's actually going to win. And this was two matches on this thing. So uh, bravo to them for that. I I appreciated that as a wrestling fan because I think that's how it should be. I think you should should ride the weight of, wave of momentum to your victory. So we're going to get Alex Shelley. He's a good opponent for, for Steve Macklin coming up. And we got Deanna Perrazzo, Knockouts World Champion versus Jordan Grace. These two always deliver. Um, they keep saying that Jordan can't beat Deanna. I thought she beat her once. So someone has to help me with that. I thought she did beat her once, though. But these two always put on a clinic. They they really have uh, the opportunity to go down as the two best knockouts ever. You know, or at least to be, on, be in that conversation with Gail Kim. But uh, they, you know, they put on the ex- excellent match that we knew they were going to put on. You know, there's there's no way you put these two in the ring and they're not going to deliver. But they really told a story where we thought, hey, shit, Jordan Grace might win this thing. But she didn't. Deanna wins once again, hit the Queen's Gambit from the second rope to win. And they have announced that Jordan Grace is going to be gone for a while. I don't know if she's going to come back. She might. If she does come back, I, I don't think it'll be on a, with a contract. I think she's going to continue to... Um, to, to wrestle without one like she has been recently. And she has other things. Obviously, the only fans going on. I know she, I, I think she might still have a shoot job that she does part time. As she stated, she just does it because she likes it, not because she needs the money. She stated that only fans, she makes more money with that, with wrestling. So, you know, she probably is looking for an opportunity to scale that even bigger and probably putting the feelers out there for a bigger company. I would like to see her come back because, you know, I, I just said she's really could go down as the best knockout ever, or the top two knockouts ever, top three. No worse than the top three. Maybe she still is, but, you know, I think this is a great home for her. I think it's been good to her. You know, I we'll see. We'll see if she's she's off for greener pastures. I don't think just because her husband works there that it's she's going to, you know, it's a, it's a fact that she's going to stick around. I mean, oh, wow, Impact hasn't worked three dates a month. Like, she's still going to spend pl- plenty of time with her husband. So I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think they do independent bookings together a lot of the time. 
So I, I really don't think that's that's going to be what it is. Now, if she goes to WWE, she can't do the OnlyFans. So, you know, we're either going to see her AEW one day or we're going to see her back in Impact do her thing. So Deanna Perrazzo moves on. Uh, they're probably going to give her a bullshit challenger for against all odds. If I had to take a guess, uh, damn, I would say Taylor Wilde, but no, because they're doing their thing. I don't think it could be Giselle Shaw at this point. Uh, Masha, you know what? I'm I'm actually going to go on a limb here and say that she's going to wrestle Jody Threaded against all odds. That's what I think. I think it's going to be a throw together match they're going to do. We'll see. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. But I'm. I would imagine a slam anniversary. They're going to do Deanna versus Trinity. I mean, I would be shocked if it wasn't. I would. I would be absolutely stunned, flabbergasted, flam boasted, um, be fumbled. You know, if it's not that match, I. I would be willing to bet every dollar I have that Trinity is going to be wrestling for a knockouts title at slam anniversary. Main event, Steve Macklin versus PCO. And wow, wow, wow. I'm going to refer to what I said to earlier, that bad television does not justify a good payoff. Think of when Bully Ray won the Bound for Glory, the, 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 the gauntlet. Now, no one wanted him to win. I think from the beginning, people were pissed about that. But the television up until him wrestling Josh was good. It wasn't like it was shit and then he had a good match. It was good. It was solid. And that's the model they got to to follow. If you're going to have a good payoff, awesome. That's what we want. But the TV also has to be good leading up to it. If you want people to care. If you want people to stick around. So I didn't really care for some of the Steve Macklin PCO stuff. All of it, not all of it. Some of it was fine. I didn't care for all of it. I thought he was a good throwaway challenger for this. When they announced it was no disqualification, I'm like, here we go. It's kind of a, it's a crutch. I mean, it's a crutch for the company, but it's also a crutch for someone like PCO, much like it is with Dreamer, because when Dreamer has to wrestle wrestle, we're like, oh, he's not that good anymore. So PCO, they got to cover up some deficiencies and it does help with the storytelling of the match to do a no DQ, but they do it so often that I just didn't really care, but they put on this match and we've been asking for Steve Macklin to look like a star, to come off like a star. Not, not, you know, he's doing fine on his end. It's, it's how they present him on screen, how they book him, And he really did with this match when he got busted up because this is an AEW where someone bleeds every week usually John Moxley we don't see a lot of blood in impact we definitely don't see it on a heel and Macklin has the crimson mask much like Stone Cold Steve Austin had once upon a time it was this was his moment this was him We've seen, we saw him take the next step. A lot of it was with the match where, you know, he hits the KIA on a pair of cinder blocks to win the match. He retains the title. So he kind of hit that star level at that point. And then after the match, he demands that Scott Demore comes out and puts a title on him because that's what he said he was going to do. Uh, Macklin refuses to shake Scott Demore's hand, and then out of nowhere, Scott Demore is attacked by Bully Ray, and he and Macklin watches as he chokes him out, and then he tells Macklin, "Get the table." Matt Raywall jumped up. He left commentary, and I don't know why they don't do more of this. When you see something like this going on in the ring, why does no one come to save the boss? This was such a good segment, but that was the one. I mean, that was attention to detail having Ray Wall try to come in and save him. 
but where were the security guards? Where were the guys coming out and trying to save Scott? This was one of the reasons that I was saying Steve Macklin needed a security detail. I mean, even Singh and Shira weren't out there to to fend anyone off, but they didn't need to because no one ran up. But that's why I was saying that was just one of the reasons I say Steve Macklin should have had a security detail. You know, it's a just there's security guards, but it's glorified, makes him look like a badass. And if he had him outside the ring, and you have the arena security guards or Java Mora and Boopy and these guys run out and try to save them. You could have had these guys fend them off because why, why was no, why did no one come out to save Scott? Especially when they knew he was going to get lit on fire, but he takes out Ray wall, takes out PCO, the motor city machine guns hit the ring and they probably did it because Alex Shelley's num- number one contender. And they look like a couple of fucking goofs. They really did not need them. Now, even though I said no one came out, obviously some people came out. PCO was already there. Motor City Machine Guns came out. But I'm referring to where's the security guards backstage? Where's the wrestlers backstage running out and not allowing this to happen? Not just the Motor City Machine Guns. But they got taken out, look like fucking goofs. Which is not how I would have presented Alex. I just wouldn't have had them come out. I would have had Boopy and all these guys come out. Not not the Motor City Machine Guns. But they light the table on fire and they powerbomb this fucking stooge Scott the headset. Scott the cuckold. They powerbomb him through the flaming table and I loved it. I appreciate what Scott Nemore does for Impact Wrestling. As a on-screen character, he annoys the piss out of me. So I really popped for this. I've I've popped anytime he's ended up on his ass, which is rare, but it happens. Um, I don't know why he didn't keep selling the the flame though, because then he was just knocked out cold. And I don't like when they do that in wrestling when they're when they're knocking people out cold from flat back bumps. I mean, why can't they just roll around in pain? I'll never, I'll never understand that. Um, but every company does that. Power bombs him through the table. And then he's, he's telling Scott, I'm going to take the company down. You hired me. I'm never leaving. And then he holds up Steve Macklin's hand. He didn't try to jump him, attack him, nothing. He held up his hand. And after stack, Steve Macklin already established himself as a star and took the next step, Bully Ray being associated with him is going to even take help him take even another step because Bully is great at what he does. I was one of the people when he showed up. I didn't want him here, but I've praised his work ever since. We don't want to see him actually wrestling for the title. We've already seen that. No one wants to see that. But if he is involved with Bully Ray, I mean, excuse me, if Bully Ray is involved with Steve Macklin, this is going to be the Steve Macklin show like I wanted. I wanted the shows in in the Steve Macklin era where he's a champion. I wanted it to become his show. Kind of like it was EC3's show at one point. Like I wanted it to be his show. And I feel like now with adding Bully Ray, that is what's going to happen. So I am looking forward. I think the next two weeks of television are going to be very good. They have no choice but for them to be good if they want a single person to care, care about under siege and not under siege, excuse me, against all odds. They need to make it good. I believe it's in Ohio. So we're going to see more Sammy and Jake Christ and um, probably wrestling design. We're probably going to get a lot of rematches, but uh, I do think that the next two weeks of television are going to be really good. There's no room for bad TV. There's no room for comedy. You just got to get to the point. Um, and with Dango, with Steve Macklin and Bully Ray, with a couple storylines that we have some interest in, you know, against all odds might be sneaky good, even with no real build. It might be sneaky good. So that's going to do it for me, everybody, talking about Under Siege. I will see you again in a few months as far as in this platform. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit from the cell phone. Like I said, my intention is to have a nice setup. Once I'm in my new home to potentially have a new logo, 
The graphics will probably remain because I do like my thumbnails right now. But uh, there might be some other changes, uh, a new intro, all that good shit. So there's going to be a little bit of a soft rebrand on my end when I do return. Um, but I'm not, you know, you can still reach out for me. I'm not going away forever. You can still reach out for me. Thanks for checking my Undersea review out, folks. I'm your boy, BQ. Peace.